Um, I describe you as a political animal. Did you always want to be an MP? Pretty much always. At the age of nine, I stood at Frith Manor School in a school election on a manifesto of opposition to the appalling quality of school meals. I was bearded by the dinner ladies for my outspoken critique. <laughs> I didn't advance an argument for compulsory competitive tendering, market testing or privatisation, but I did have a fairly populist, you'll be familiar with the concept, Philip, populism, <laughs> opposition to those school meals. So I was quite political at that point, as in argumentative. The local press said I had a strong platform manner. And then from 15 or 16, I became determinedly political. And there were two factors. It was the state of the country, streets unswept, sick people untreated, dead people unburied, and the sense that the unions were running the show. That was the negative that propelled my interest. And the positive was that I went to school in Margaret Thatcher's constituency. I went to hear her speak. I met her afterwards and was inspired. And so the rest is history. So that's a roundabout way of saying pretty much always. For a very short period of about three months in 1983, I flirted with the idea of becoming an academic. But really from 16 onwards, I always wanted one day to be a Member of Parliament. I never had any aspiration at that point to be a minister or an office holder, but did I want to represent a constituency and speak up for people and, indeed, hear the sound of my own voice? <laughs> I did. Now, you started out on the far right of the Conservative Party. There was reportedly Hang Nelson Mandela T-shirts and uh, the Repatriation Committee of the Monday Club and... Uh, Norman Tebbit closing down the Federation of Conservative Students because it was so right-wing, even for, for his taste. H how much of that is, is true? And where did those beliefs come from? I was a member of the Immigration, Repatriation and Race Relations Industry Subcommittee of the Monday Club. And as I've said on a number of occasions, that is the most shameful feature of my political record. I'm very embarrassed about that. I'm very apologetic for it. And I feel contrite. I didn't think of myself as a racist, but I was sidling up to people who certainly were racist, and I feel very guilty about that. I'm afraid I must take responsibility for it, but if you say, well, where did it come from? Was there someone else involved? The answer is that I did inhale from my late father. And although my late father was himself Jewish and was brought up in Dalston in Hackney in the 1930s and knew about the Cable Street riots and the threat of the black shirts and so on, he himself was very hostile to new Commonwealth and Pakistani immigration, and I think I was influenced by him, but I was wrong. I never wore a Hang Nelson Mandela T-shirt, but several members of the Federation of Conservative Students did. I was chairman at the time that the FCS was formally closed down, but the record will show that Norman Tebbit closed down the Federation in spite and not because of me, and he appointed me to run the successor body. So that's the full unvarnished truth. I have a chequered history. I made bad judgments and mistakes. But sometimes, either through malice or ignorance, people lump it all together and say, well, all of that was Burko's record. You have only to ask Norman, and Norman will tell you, I didn't close the Federation down because of John. At the time, I thought John was the sanest person in the street. Now, you, when you got elected to Parliament in 1997, you were the darling of the right wing of the Conservative Party, and yet you ended up by supporting the Labour Party. Most people get more right wing as they get older. How come you've become more left wing as you've got older? I accept it's odd. I don't know whether that thesis about people becoming more conservative as they get older, which I've always believed is empirically supported, but certainly anecdotally, that's been my experience. A lot of people start on the left and move rightwards, and I have done the opposite. How so? A lot of Conservatives were influenced by the 1997 election, when we were virtually wiped out. Funnily enough, I wasn't. I remained rabidly right-wing for a number of years after that. Philip Esther, the election that really influenced me, that if you like, knocked me for six, was the 2001 election, because I had railed and invaded against the Blair government. I didn't at the time have a high opinion of Tony Blair or of New Labour, and I represented a very conservative constituency, and I thought, well, presumably they will be reined back, the majority will be slashed, or 
better still, we'll get into office. In 2001, after four years of that government, we lost again, not by 178, but by 167, a majority of 167. And the Conservative seat tally went up from 165 to 166. That was the product of four years of the leadership of Mr. William Haig. And I thought, well, I didn't think much of that first four years of New Labour. But look where we are. We're hardly in any better position. So I thought to myself, what's at the root of this? And my judgment was that people disapproved of us on so many fronts. They thought we knew the price of everything and the value of nothing, that we hadn't atoned for our attitude to and weakening of the public services. And they thought, frankly, we were rather unpleasant. The so-called nasty party image seemed to me to contain more than a grain of truth. In fact, I think at one point I said we were widely regarded as racist, sexist, homophobic and anti-youth. That didn't make me think, well, I don't want to be a member of the Conservative Party, but it did make me think the Conservative Party is going to have to shift substantially, both as a matter of principle and as a matter of political pragmatism. Now, you may think I was wrong or you may think I was right, but that was why and how I came to shift from the hard right towards the political centre.